rising family this is pharaoh brown and we are back for another edition of we meditate reading sessions and in this particular session we are initiating a brand new read of the vodun quantum universe the vodun quantum universe is a book that was written by dr uh, reginald crosley and Dr. Reginald Crosley is a medical doctor, or PhD, who is of Haitian descent and who has studied uh, formal uh, modern science as well as quantum physics. And he is essentially doing a very deep and great writing that is unpacking the central and or hidden tenets of the Vodou religion as it relates to the study of quantum physics and Dr. Crowsley begins the process of unpacking some of the inner secrets that exist in Vodun to help one debunk some of the myths that exist but to also show that the true spiritual nature of Vodun is literally attached to gateways of other dimensions of other manifestations of reality and so on and so forth and so with this particular book we are going to journey through the chapters and simply overview the information so that we can have a greater understanding of Dr. Crosley's work. Um, but more importantly, so that we can have a greater understanding of an indigenous form of religion that connects to the different gateways and portals to the other side and expressing this through the actual validity of scientific exploration as we know it today. So. Just getting right into it, I will begin with the forward and go accordingly. Generally spelled V-O-O-D-O-O, the commercial literature of the English language, Vodou, V-O-D-O-U, is rarely been taken in earnest by Western scholars in of the industrialized nations. The ignorance of it at the art of the ignorance of it at the art of living the African people, coupled probably with the general prejudice against tribalism, has resulted in Vodou being scorned with disdain by many members of the scientific institutions who often deemed it inferior and unworthy of attention. In an academic milieu, therefore, they, where all efforts have been made to ignore such a tradition, Dr. Reginald Crosley stands as a courageous model indeed as well as an exception for he has taken that particular way of life of the Haitian people to a new scientific conceptual height. He lifted up at least theoretically to a limit where no one before him has believed it conceivable. This book, The Vodou Quantum Leap, is, un is undoubtedly a pioneering work that must raise significant interest in, your pop in our population. It is an inspiring effort that should help stimulate creative thinking on Vodou, and induce further reflections on the intellectual production of humanity. Many reasons might have led to the undertaking of such a difficult task at the dawn of the new millennium. First, Dr. Crosley might have realized that it provided his country of origin, Haiti, with a rich heritage for the study of religion, mythology, and arts in general, psychotherapeutics, medicine, metaphysics, and even quantum physics. Secondly, Dr. Crosley might have also understood that people in the world should no longer act as if they were totally independent from one another, neither as individuals nor as nations. Our lives are all intertwined, whether we like it or not, whether in fact we acknowledge it or not. The time has finally arrived for a new spiritual and ethical awareness. Religious people, practicing atheists, agnostics, or humanists should all abide in this self-evidence. It would indeed be better for all people of all races, nations, and religions to understand it and each other. Nevertheless, for certain specialists of anthropology, uh, ethno um, sorry, ethnology, and history of religions, Vodou has long been acknowledged as the art of living of the population who remained indigenous to the African continent and also of the descendants of the people who grew up in the New World. In Haiti, for instance, there are so many of the latter have been living in past centuries, Vodouists remember that for the past millennia, their African forefathers had developed to their benefit very sophisticated models of human behavior and experience. For these reasons, among others, they have chosen to remain proud and loyal to their ancestral tradition. Better accepted by those experts 
in sociology as the religious tradition of the Haitian people, they also accredit it as a system of thought that implies a, cosm a cosmology, I'm sorry, cosmology, a mythology, and a reservoir of knowledge, in short, a culture. They found the persons responsible for the early development of it, the Hongian and the Mambo, to be the first men and the first women in the world who built and managed a social order and who constructed, elaborated, and sculpturously cared for a full-fledged belief system. They were, in fact, the first religions of the first religious functionaries who acted as priests and priestesses of any religion known to humanity. Through their intuition and rational observations, they became able to determine what should be the proper attitude, emotion, and correct behavior to apply when approaching the elemental principle of the universe, or when dealing with any one of her 401 forms of power named the LOA, L-O-A, R-L-W-A, R-L-O-A-H, a word which somewhat resembles the Eloah of the Hebrew language, or Elohim, which means God, or the El. God, the Unana Lizabel, yes, Unana Lizabel, excuse my pronunciation, is simply seen as a concept in our tradition. This tenet in Vodou remains, um, this, this tenet in Vodou merely means a fundamental energy where all other types of energy find their origin. She has no mass, has never had one, but she always existed as pure spirit as an energy that has the power to intervene in the affairs of the universe. As all animals and plants that bear children or fruits are usually seen as female, the source of all existing energies is usually referred to a woman named Yiwe, Y-E-H-W-E. Again, a word that resembles that of Yahweh of the Hebrew language. She is perceived as the mother of the universe and creator of all things that exist or existed. The nature of God, the origin and the development of her many forms of power or expressions, the lower, show what is termed a cosmology. Their attributes spread through the four basic elements of nature, water, air, fire, and the equilibrium they maintain between themselves with the world, their justifications, has been design, designated as a theosity. To this perception, one generally adds certain adjoining seminal concepts such as the immortality of the soul and the freedom of will. The theology itself is always very well exposed by virtue of examples and is usually expressed in simple language that everyone may easily understand. Vodou then must be seen as a fundamentally monotheistic religion of African origin. It exposes the image of one single feminine God who at the origin lived alone in the universe and who later on gave birth by successive emanations to spirits, humanity, animals, and plants. The human beings, as all living things, are also consequently seen as forces, that is, on one hand as energies by virtue of the fact that they have life, which is a part of God, and on the other hand as energies that are lessened by the fact that they have substantial they have a substantial and perishable body. The mythical genesis of the mythical genesis teaches that the universe includes two worlds, one that of the visible and that of the invisible. Much larger than the visible world, the invisible one is replete of energies, including the spirits of all those who have lived and existed since the beginning of times. It also incorporates the major forces of the universe, the lower. These two worlds are by no means seen as distinct and distinctive. Um, excuse me, distinct and disjunctive. To the contrary, they are assumed to interpretate and interpret and interpenetrate each other harmoniously, and the spirits, those energies in them, mingle continually. Named soul, quotations, the particular energy specific to the human being must not be confused with the mind, which involves conscious and unconscious thoughts generally processed by the brain. Though it is seen as what generally engenders the rational, the emotional, and the volitional faculties, hence determining all behaviors, the soul is conceived as forming a whole entity by itself, totally distinct from the body and from the mind. It involves the principles of life. Not having in itself any physical or material reality, the soul is regarded as being the immortal or spiritual part of the person 
which is capable of surviving one's physical death. Acting as a true axis of life, it is perceived as being perpetually in motion. It circles around its own axis and vibrates continuously like the specific part of the soul now. The differences that exist between the energies of the many living organisms and also in the subparticles of the soul in the human being are due to the vibrations which are generated differently, qualitatively, and in, and in intensity. These vibrations are seen as dissimilar from one another because they have, each one of them, a unique rate, amplitude, and mode of vibration. The influence and manifestations of those movements extend to the mental activities of human being, and they account for the bewildering successions of mood, feeling, and other changes that one may often notice in anyone's behavior. So in any very harmonious, excuse me, so in a very harmonious manner, the soul carries along with it in its movements the two other components of human being, the body and the mind. It does so to the point where, when the soul goes well, everything adjusts itself to it and goes well too. Conversely, when it is in disorder or in disharmony, that is when it is out of equilibrium and everything else follows the same way. As such, the human soul is seen as a complex concept of the point where a synthetic term does not even exist to designate the whole. This is manipulation, since its manipulation is highly specializing. The word nam, N-A-N-M, which is probably comes from the African word nyam, N-Y-A-M, refers to a specific part of this conglomerate. It, however, is often abusely applied by extension, I suppose, roughly to English to translate the word soul. This abused and collective term, nam, is therefore understood to be the seat of several spiritual entities, Atiban Anj, that's A, T I B O N A N J, A Guo Bonange, Anam, A Lua Metet, the Wianson, a set of Lua Raisin, a Lua Raison, maternal and paternal, also called Lua Eritage. Please excuse my pronunciation, these are inherently French and African, and I am African American, so I do not know the origin of the tones. But we'll work with it. Continuing on. And one of them, the Zeta Wall, which is not even perceived as being localized in one's physical body, but rather in a star. Consequently, it becomes impossible to refer to the individual as one who has mere corporeal unity, the body being viewed as accommodating only a part of the person. Furthermore, the spirits of clan ancestors also belong to this group of forces of influence. They are recognized and often honored for the continued impact on human activities. The minute one is born, then as a human being, that person should be defined as a spiritual psychosocial entity who exists in a continuous state of energetic equilibrium. All these spiritual elements in him or her acting as emanating forces, they confer to the person a very particular sense of appreciation for the fundamental aspects of life or the existence. They are energies that function not only at the level of the individual, but also the community. They set, at, they set the ideas or, and the norms of logic, moral ethics, and aesthetics that therefore become no longer matters of individuals alone, of course, but matters of societies which are nothing else but the sum of a people. Together, these energies orient the human beings in their society and societies in their environment. They help to establish guidelines and direction for that which con uh, concerns logic, ethics, morals, and aesthetics, to set up codes and conduct understood to be the mores or tradition, and led one to the path and peace of happiness. Everyone relates to them and to each other, and no human exists except in relationship. The fundamental function of these forces is consequently to serve as reference to the life in society, nature, and the universe. In entitling his book, The Voting Quantum Leap, Dr. Crosley has probably been thinking in terms of dynamics, the one of these energies that jump from distance to distance. The quanta theory, which is succeeded with one rel of relatively, I'm sorry, which is succeeded the one of relativity by Albert Einstein, was undoubtedly a major innovation in physics. 
Dr. Crosley has prolonged its physical application to its philosophical implications. Dealing with the motions considered of extremely small scale or dimension, fractal or quanta, they usually involve the movements of tiny parcels of space and time. Of course, the term small scale is used to delineate the domain of quantum mechanics should not be literally interpreted here. Rather, it should be viewed as relating nevertheless to a certain extent in space. A more precise criterion as to whether quantum modifications of the Newtonian law should be of importance here is whether or not the phenomenon in question is characterized by an action, that is, by the time integ uh, integral of the kinetic energy. When a great many quanta are evolved at the same time in action, the work then becomes quite significant. True, the unit is small, but this should be seen as totally indifferent just to a millionaire just as to a millionaire, it makes little difference whether the smallest unit of current is the cent or the dollar. And that concludes the forward. So as we see here, there are many elements that are going to be unpacked and, uh, and discovered. Um, but essentially, we are just getting started. And so we have not even entered into the content yet, but we are just touching upon the ethos of the book and of what Dr. Crosley is seeking to unpack for us all. And so we will continue on to the preface. Most people think they know what Vodou is all about. People immediately think of black magic, witchcraft, root, charm, spells, hexes, jinx, conjuration, zombies, goofer dust, sorcery, evil spirits, striking, uh, the striking of needles into dolls, are entities such as Dracula, hags, and werewolves. Others get more sporty with the word and use it in a sense of wonderful, fantastic feats or enterprises such as voodoo economics. In the last decade of the 20th century, a computer game called Voodoo 3 also allows players to enjoy the advantages of three-dimensional processing capabilities. The latter of the word voodoo ironically is not too far from the truth. In African Fawn language, the word voodoo means force, energy, and spirit. In revealing the fundamental forces of nature, modern physics has opened the door to a technology of wonders in our everyday life. The African word voodoo is in fact an, uh, an accumulated knowledge that masters the handling of these forces and has been transmitted from generation to generation through initiation or schooling in seclusion. The 20th century is unique in the history of mankind from the point of view of physical sciences as well as from the standpoint of spiritual enlightenment. From the deep secrets of nature or the universe are being discovered at a rapid pace and a wonderful and the wonderful applications of these knowledges in modern technologies will be matched for the near future by discoveries in the spirit world and their application into a spiritual technology. We can assume with a high degree of hope that in the 20th century, humankind will be able to travel at will through the space-time tunnel into, past and into the past and into the future, as the knowledge to accomplish these exploits is already present in the traditions of, African, of the African continent and its offshoot in the island of Haiti. Pause on that. Think about that for a second. So, going on, this body of knowledge is transmitted through the oral tradition of Vodou during initiation in the ancestral religion of Africa. Amazingly enough, science in the 20th century has redefined reality by revealing a continuum between the spiritual and the physical. Psychic energy, uh, spelled P-S-I, or Psi, is present in every fractal of the universe on a par with the other four major forces of nature so that we have to change our narrow understanding of matter, mind, soul, and spirit. By doing so, we can now understand the concepts presented by the Vodou vision of the world. We will realize that it is not a world of make-believe, pure superstition, or ignorance. In order to pave the way for the reader and to facilitate his or her introduction into the wonder of the Vodou world, the first two chapters after the introduction discussed the different aspects of the common reality, the reality of the philosopher, the artist, 
the believers of various religions, uh, religions and the reality of science from um, e Elucid and Newton down to the quantum reality. The paradoxes and startling discoveries of relativity theories, quantum mechanics, and chaos theory will help the curious mind understand the exotic phenomenon, the singularities, and the concepts of Vodou alternate reality. From there, you will realize that Vodou is not black magic, devil worshiping, or, or, or ignorant animism. The crisis of possession or channeling of the adepts is not a disease, not a hereditary nervous disorder as described by medical authorities in the first part of the 21st century, excuse me, 20th century. Furthermore, you will recognize that the Haitian voodoo is different from the root belief or root work of the syn syn syncretic Protestant African tradition of the Gullah people in the coastal islands of South Africa, although they share many things in common. In St. Helena Island, according to Roger Pinney, uh, Pinky, who was born and raised in both uh, Bullfront County, South Carolina, there is a remnant of the slave culture, but not the Ifa uh, religion of the long gone Yoruba Empire in its entirety. The dancer and artist William S. King, in search of his African roots, could not find it among the Gullah people. Thus, in 1970, he traveled to Nigeria, the land of his ancestors, to discover that the Ifa religion opens the door to higher consciousness to oneness with all creation by teaching a system of ethics, religious belief, and mystic vision. The African spiritual journey seeks to bring a composite state between earthly consciousness and heavenly consciousness. The adepts call on the support of ancestral spirits, aka the Loa, to succeed in their spiritual endeavor. Must I mention also that in Haiti, like with the Gullah people, there exist root doctors who are not voodoo priests, but are individuals knowledgeable in herbs, plants, and roots. After taking full voodoo initiation, some root doctors become uh, voodoo priests or priestess. And that is, and the priest is Honguan, H-O-U-N-G-A-N, and the priestess is Mambo, M-A-M-B-O. Haitian voodoo is a complex religious system, a Weltanschein, or a world vision large enough to incorporate many aspects of Catholicism, Amerindian sham, I'm sorry, Amerindian shamanism, Freemason, Rosicrucian practices, and Gnosticism. In fact, voodoo has preceded most of the world's religions because voodoo has at its root has its root in the Neolithic Sahara. Vodou also has a syncretic amalgamating tendency from the beginning as the, the homians of their hegemonic tradition made from the ancestors and deities conquered in tribes of nation. Vodou continues to do so with Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Just a small pause there. A lot of deep words and big ideolo ideological statements and descriptions of things have been made but simply saying that Vodou is attributed to be the original religion or the original gateway to the spirit world and people of the priest traditions are the first ones to understand and unpack these things, which have been boiled down into these later traditions, i.e. Catholicism, shamanism, Freemasonry, and Rosicrucianism. That's all they said there. But let's continue on. I did not want to present to the public a watered-down version of Vodouism, one that presents only the benign aspect of the religion and agape-type community, the kibbutz or the local settlement orientation, the benevolent lower spirits called angels or saints by other groups. I wanted to approach Vodou in its entirety, with its wonders, singularities, fantastic characteristics, as well as its nefarious, dangerous, and deadly aspects. In a sense, Vodou is like nuclear energy or force that can be that can have peaceful as well as catastrophic applications. The concept of the afterlife in Vodou is on par with the ancient Egyptian presentation of the netherworld. Vodou reveals the complexity, the composite nature of humankind. We are not simply a physiochemical entity as presented by the modern physio physiology and medicine. We have components are souls that share similarities with shadow matter or dark matter of contemporary physics, 
Energy dimensions that can be boosted or invigorated by mental as well as physical means. Many religions in Vodou agree that we can acquire another spiritual component by a new birth in the internal dimension. The new science called chaos, um, the new science called chaos theory has also given us newly discovered fundamental laws of nature that can be seen as archetypes, um, namely the Feinbaum universal concept of self-similarity and scaling the fractals or parcels of Mendenbrot and the butterfly effect of Edward Lorenz. These laws help understand the inner workings of many rituals in Vodou. Like Vodou, there are major religions of the world, but also in such also in search of transcendence. Souls of departed ones must evolve in a spiritual realm and become transformed into ancestral deities. A final transcendence would be the translation of time into the eternity of the grand mate or the creator or the Yahweh. I am Haitian American currently practicing uh, was it allopathic medicine in the United States. And this is me reading as the reader. I am not Haitian American. <laughs> I studied medicine at the Faculty de Medicine of Haiti before my immigration to the United States in 1967. This is actually Dr. Crosley speaking now. I was raised and nurtured in the Haitian culture, which is a comp uh, composite of African, French, and Armenian civilizations. I apologize, Amerindian civilizations. The elders of my family on my mother's side before their conversion to Protestantism were adepts of the voodoo religion and they lived by the tenets of synchronitism born of the association of Catholicism and African traditions. In my childhood, I was introduced into voodoo's inner sanctum and included in rituals reserved by my family. We, re we received our tribal uh, scarifications on our right arms. My personal interest in voodoo is that of metaphysical, anthropological, ethnological, and medical nature. In this area of holistic medicine, physicians and other health professionals must become familiar with the worldviews of patients from different cultures. The alternate reality of the Vodou universe, though veiled in secrecy, is a fact of life in my extended family and in the Haitian society at large. I have been particularly diligent in helping to erase the stigma that the Western world attaches to Vodou. The Vodou religion stands in the same lofty grounds with other world religions, ancient and modern. Vodou offers the same spiritual experiences as do other major religions such as Taoism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and Amerindian shamanism. Seekers of enlightenment can have the same rapturous experiences in the realm of Vodou as with other religions. I have studied Vodou from a metaphysical standpoint since the 1960s. My book is the result of a uh, protracted inquiry into the writings of anthropologists, ethnologists, theologians, uh, physicians, and importantly, the observations of my people, the Haitians. The wonders of modern physics had opened my eyes to the splendor of hyperspace in the early 1960s when I wrote a book of poetry in French entitled Immanences, I-M-M-A-N-E-N-C-E-S. I was related to know that other uh, scientists have discovered the wonder of modern physics and metaphysics in the works of the Tao of Physics by Friedhoff Capra, that's F-R-I-T-J-O-F, Capra, C-A-P-R-A, -A, and the taking of, and the taking the quantum leap by Fred Allen Wolf. The enlightenment they have discovered in the alternate reality of the Far East is also present next door in the island of Haiti. Vodou, the Cuban Santeria, and the Brazilian Candomblé share a common alma mater, or a fostering mother, the wisdom of the black continent. Vodou's uh, accumulated knowledge of the reality goes back to the Neolithic age. Vodou can teach us of many spiritual truths that are being rediscovered by modern science. The creation of a spiritual technology will benefit humankind as we find harmony with ourselves, with each other, and with the universe. Moving on, we have completed the forward. We're now approaching the introduction. In the beginning of Friedhoff's Free Friedhoff's Copras, the Tao of Physics, a pioneering book that explored the parallels between modern physics and Eastern mysticism, 
Then came a wealth of excellent works by the other writers exploiting the new metaphysics born of the analogies discovered between quantum physics interpretations and the explanations of reality given by the Eastern seers are mystics. The parallelism was extended to the mysticism of the West and a composite form has appeared in biology, medicine, and psychology. Lately, with Robert Gilmore's wandering uh, in Alice in Quantum Land, the parallelism has been introduced to the Western fairyland. What is left untouched is the mysticism of the land of Africa and its offshoot in America, and the particular, and in particular, the African Haitian alternate alternate reality and mysticism. It is my aim to reveal the analogies between quantum physics, relativity, chaos theories, and the metaphysics of the magic island of Haiti. This will allow us to penetrate the complexity of a reality that is not the product of primitive mentality, but rather that of an intelligence that acknowledges the plural dimensional nature of existence, the parallel universes, and all the wonders of being and becoming. The misunderstood island of Haiti has inherited the mysticism of the world of the whole of black Africa has uprooted men and women from diverse tribes in Western, Central, Southern, and Eastern Africa, were transported to the island with their religious traditions. Through Maron, Maron, Maronage, M-A-R-R-O-N-A-G-E, they have coalesced these traditions into a synchronitism that is known today as the Vodou religion. Many people will be startled to hear the term Vodou religion because they have been brainwashed by the media to equate Vodou with witchcraft and idolatry. The African Haitian civilizations are more complex and sophisticated than that. We are dealing with a world vision as complex as Eastern and Western versions of the universe. My interest in physics and metaphysics dates back to 1959. This is Crosley speaking. During the last year of my baccalaureate degree and my acceptance of the Fauquet de Medicine in Port Porto Prince, Haiti, that dual interest was harmoniously blended in the activity of poetry. I was introduced in 1962 to the group Haiti Literature by my friend and classmate, a poet, Serge Leganeur. That group was not, uh, was not a literary school, but a club of poets oriented around modernity. In December 1963, the journal of Ron de Pont dedicated issue number 12 to the young poets of Haiti literature. At that time, Serge did, and I did not have any published poems in Haiti. This was different for the other members, such as Ronald Marceau, Rene Polcharet, Raymond Polcharet, Anthony Phelps, Jean Janine Trevenier Louis, uh, Jean Richard Lafouette, and Dever and Devertige. The celebrated author of of Edem, I D E M, a book of poetry praised by the French critic Alain Bossuet in a journal of Le Monde. For the presentation of the group of public to the public, some sections of unpublished poems were chosen from the works of our group. Later on, all the works of Legonor were published in Montreal. In my book of poetry was published in 1988 in Canada by the editions Cydia. All of the poems in the book were composed between 1959 and 1966. During those years, the wind of modernity was in the air and we were all seeking new vistas in the world of poetry. To me, enlightenment fell. To me, enlightenment in the field came about my meditation. My meditation on the principles or paradoxes of the new physics and re revelations of our mystical traditions. I had discovered some analogies between the quantum world and the mystical dimensions in my search of ultimate reality. Through poetic meditation, I came to understand the plight of the surrealists before us who were seeking the source of poetic inspiration. This was revealed to me through what I what can be called a poetic trance. With a sort of zazen or sitting meditation, the poet is engulfed into a whirling vortex, a maelstrom that ends up in other universes from which he brings new revelations or images. To come out of that poetic trance, he has to unwind, so to speak, by turning the vortex the other way around. 
Thus, meditation or contemplation on the principles of modern physics and the revelations of scriptures have given me the awakening to the unity of all things in space-time. I was awakened to the vision of a unitary principle that the language of poetry can reflect on a comprehensive matter, a manner. This seems to be in harmony with the idea conveyed by Werner Heisenberg and one of the founders of modern physics, where he states, if the harmony in a society rests in a common interpretation of the one, quote, the unitary principle behind the phenomena, then the language of poetry may be more important here than the language of science. End quote. Here it is very interesting to note that the that the same decade that saw the emergence of the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics was one that gave birth to the Surrealist movement. The Surrealist foray into the realm of unknown dimensions of reality preceded the formulations of Niels Bohr and the Warner Heisenberg of the Fifth Solvay Congress in Brussels, Belgium in 1927, which were to become the tenets of the Copenhagen School of Thought. André Bertrand, the founder of Surrealism, described uh, excuse me, published the first manifesto on the Surrealist movement in 1924 in France. Breton's search for the surreal reality is in fact the search for an ultimate reality. Surrealism can be envisioned as the search for the unbroken wholeness of a pluridimensional reality. Following Breton's personal encounter with Sigmund Freud in 1922, he started to work on hypnosis with other poets of his group, namely Crevel, Desnos, Eluard, Perret, and Picabia. Picabia, excuse me. However, he had disco discovered the writings of Freud and in his revelation of the subconscious by 1915, when he was a medical student pondering on the means of exploiting the subconscious as the source of poetic inspiration. Hypnosis was one of the methods used by the French poets to penetrate the mesmerian world of the subconscious into a attain a holistic approach in creativity. The rational part of the individual must free the irrational part, the subconscious self, and allow its dynamics to reveal reality in all its dimensions, to create poetry or in any other forms of arts without hindrance. The surrealist mo uh, methods of penetrating the ultimate reality are equivalent in many aspects to a tr transcendental meditation technique. There is more than one method to reach the trance state that throws the individual in the sur surreality where he is all in all, where he indwells the unbroken wholeness of David Baum or the universal soul or the Eastern mystics. Britain, uh, Britain called the state inspiration, quote, it is the equivalent of the supreme ultimate, quote, or the Tai Chetu. In Chinese Tao, it is achieved through short circuits, quote, by suppressing the main circuit or the rational one to allow the subconscious component of the individual psyche to take over the conscious part of the formation processing network. Um, insert my two cents. He's essentially saying to get into tap into your subconscious mind and allow your subconscious to influ your conscious mind and to get those things into alignment. Going forward, Andre Britton and his colleagues tried to reproduce those short circuits through automatic writing, a cadre equis, a poem written by a collaboration of many poets, free associations, dream reconstructionists, hypnosis, and probably psychedelic drugs. Some of these methods were only mimicking the real thing, the poetic trance state, or they were just means to break the ambiguity, ambiguity barrier that separate us from the blessed state of inspiration. Breton described it as a state that overcomes the individual like a crisis of possession or a dorkism. The crisis is seen as an overwhelming emotion that grabs, subjugates, crushes, dominates the individual and pushes him into the immortal and sometimes against his will. We can also see here the he see here the ring W-R-A-N-G, or a coercive power of the Germans in being described in as they describe hypnosis or possession. The word immortal used by Britain, a uh, Breton, can be replaced more adequately by the terms such as perpetual now, ambiguous now, state of sim simultaneity, 
or the ultimate now of the Eastern mystics. This is the poetic trance similar to the Eastern experience of entering a higher state of consciousness, which is a higher multidimensional reality or surreality. Thus, the revolution in art in the early part of the 20th century has preceded also the New Age movement of a, as a Western form of attainment in, enlighten, in enlightenment. Surrealism as a discipline in enlightenment was seeking total liberation or nirvana like the Hindu or Buddhist seers. Though the attainment of a higher state of consciousness, the poets were expecting to discover the universal self or the awakening of the ultimate reality. Thus, that discipline was using laboratory methods and dream experiences and hypnosis and its literary productions did not conform to the aesthetic rules or moral laws or injunctions. Some people see a dogma in the manifestos of Andre Britton. The poets of the Surrealist school wanted to continue a revolution that started in the 19th century with the Romantic school and the symbologist in France, which was a liberation from the rigid shackles of classicism and from the decree of rhymes and rhythms. One of their cherished pioneers in the search for enlightenment was Arthur Rembrandt, a precious genius I'm sorry, a precocious genius, author of A Season in Hell, who wanted to be a seer, a visionary. He used the technique of staring into, of starting to develop psychic abilities, as well as practicing similar transcendental meditation, contemplation, and self-hypnosis. The surrealist movement wanted also to see the total liberation of men and women on a social level as well. The poets of the French school had joined the Communist Party in their country, but they remain upset in the eyes of Marxist, Leninist, and Revisionist. They could not be obedient to the command of the uh, proletariat. Their metaphysics were too idealist to conform to the vision of the dialectical materialism. But Britain's ambition was something similar to the incorporation of the yin yang of the Taoist and Japanese Zen. In other words, the attainment of spiritual liberation along with material liberation. This explains the success in Haiti when he visited the island in 1945. The country was in need of social liberation and the youth saw in Britain an apostle of revolution. From the preceding considerations, we can see that the 20th century was oriented around enlightenment from the first decades, not only in literature and the arts, but also in physical sciences. According to Gary Zukav, author of The Dancing with We Lou Masters, the Cop uh, Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics, excuse me, quantum mechanics, began a monumental synthesis that went unnoticed at the time. It was the merger of the rational part of our psyche represented by science with that other part of us, the intuitive or rational side. With the emergence of the age of reason, the intuitive part was labeled la folie du logis, or the crazy one by the French thinkers. The new physics revealed to us that a complete understanding of reality requires more than the capabilities of rational thought. We have to pay heed to the input given to the other side of our personality in a complementary fashion. This is at the core of the Copenhagen interpretation and is known as Bohr's principle in, con in, complementi in complementarity. The Western world is proud of its achievements, so its left hemispheric brain that part excuse me. The Western world is proud of its proud of the achievements of its less left hemispheric brain, that part which is the seat of reason. Thus, there is a bias for the favor of rational, the assertive, or the masculine aspect of us, while relegating the right hemispheric brain to the status of second class citizen. That right side, which is equated with the intuitive, the receptive, or the feminine aspect of the personality, has had achieved recognition with the advent of Freud's discovery of the unconscious or the double of the mesmerites. We will see later how the notion of the double will help us understand the African-Haitian metaphysics. According to Zukav, the Copenhagen interpretation was an acknowledgement of the limitations of the Cartesian or logical mode of thinking and of the psychic aspects 
that have been venerated for a very long time in Eastern civilizations and in African Haitian civilization as well. The notion of complementary uh, complementarity was stipulated by Pierre Riverdi when refining the surrealistic image in poetry. For him, the image was born in the compl complementary of two opposite realities. The product was a many-sided or multi-dimensional impression resulting from the super, uh, superimposition of single impressions coming from different viewpoints. To use the words of Lama Govita, the author of Foundations of Tibetan Mysticism, Paul Lacroix, a young Haitian poet who attended the speeches of Andre Britton when later visited Haiti, approached him as if he were a guru or a mage. In the article published by Noville Apoutique, he quoted the words of the sur surrealist Pope, where he reminded us of the yin-yang quest of Taoism. The surrealist enlightenment consists in getting access to that dimension where life and death, the real and the imaginary, the past and the future, the speakable and the unspeakable, the top and the bottom cease to be seen as opposites. It was the end of World War II that Andre Britton visited the magic island of Haiti. He was spellbound by the beauty of the land that he was that was in colonial times nicknamed the Pearl of the Antilles. In a speech delivered at the Savoy Cafe restaurant in Port-au-Prince, he confessed his elation in looking at the scrumptious drapery of trees and brushes. To him, Haiti was a land of elation, a repository of poetic thinking, a permanent temptation of poetic vision. There, nature speaks without hindrance. There was something hallucinatory in that land where mystery abounds in the forests, the mountains, the ravines, the rivers, the ponds, and the sea. Now, at the beginning of the 21st century, one may concur with him and use a new epithet to call Haiti the Quantum Island. Andre Britton was surprised to see that the message of the Surrealist movement was nothing foreign to the Haitian psyche. What he was struggling to implant in the mind of the contemporary Europeans was already a part of the Haitian world vision. The Haitian Africans, like the American Indians, had remained close to the source of poetry and the sources of surrealism. He also confessed that his disciples in France and elsewhere in, in the Western world had been trying to reestablish the link with the primeval consciousness, that internal voice that exists within all men. The psychic force that is more familiar to Haitians than to the Europeans is illustrated in Haitian voodoo. In, pressions, in periods of social and moral crisis, it was very important, according to the author Nadia, to scrutinize that primeval psychic force in order to rediscover the authentic aspirations of the human being. In an interview by René LeBlanc, a surrealist Haitian poet, Brenton stressed that the fact that poetry must maintain the contact with the primeval infrastructure of the human beings, which is the subconscious mind, the primitive part of the man and woman, or the wave function that connects us with the universal panpsychic field of our new metaphysics. It is a reservoir of infinite resources. In just a pause, caveat moment, as it is quoted here in the book, it is showing that these quote unquote primitive people um, who live in the Caribbean, who do not build up their nations to the quote unquote mastery of the white world or the modern world, they have the links to the greatest wisdom that goes beyond our human capabilities. As it has already been stressed that modernity and left brain logic, as it's been raised up as the preeminent way of life and worldview, they are already unpacking and debunking these notions. Because the preeminent worldview of today, of modernity, of left brain rationality, of building up things the way that we know it, it is somewhat, or as they are alluding to, completely devoid of operating in the flow of spirit. So, just keep that in mind as we continue on. However, according to Georges Castera Jr., in spite of the triumphal entry of Britain into Haiti, there was no official enrollment of Haitian poets in the Surrealist school. Nevertheless, there was a very strong influence of Surrealist tenets in many Haitian writers. The Haitian Surrealists, um, Maglor St. Aoud, René Balanche, and others did not practice the dream experience or hypnosis. They were interested in automatic writing. 
a production of fantastic images and dreams and dream stories. The influence of surrealism continues down to the 1960s in the writings of the poets of Haitian literature. And it's also present in the gener in the genesis of the new school called sp spiralism, created by Frank Etienne and Rene uh, Fil Fil Filochet. The latter being a former member of uh, Haiti literature. In fact, Haitian writers did not have to officially join the School of Britain because there already existed in Haiti a popular universe dominated by the strange fantasies, strange fantastic. Yeah, this, um, excuse me. Haitian writers did not have the did not have to officially join the School of Britain because they there already existed in Haiti a popular universe dominated by the strange, the fantastic, the weird, the singular, and the dream world that confers to our ordinary reality a surrealistic character. Furthermore, we must say that Andre Britton and his bewilderment about Haiti, surrealism, or mysticism did not have a chance to experience firsthand profound singularities of the island's alternate reality. Behind the composite state of the rational and the irrational that had discovered in our culture, and behind the Freudian subconscious and psychoanalysis, exist other dimensions and forces that not only the ontological understanding of humans found in African Haitian vision of the universe can explain. The tenets of the new metaphysics derived from principles of quantum physics, relativity, and chaos theories can help us understand that ontological vision. The parallelism between the principles of quantum physics and Eastern mysticism, and by extrapolation to all mysticism, be it Kabbalah, Gnosticism, Rosicrucianism, or African Haitian metaphysics, has been challenged by many thinkers of the Western world. They have warned us of the danger that such an association can be for true religious mysticism. Of course, we must pay heed to these warnings, because no matter how tangible those analogies may seem to be, they should not lead us to the conclusion that physical sciences in their experiments have reached the spiritual dimension of the imminent existence or of the biblical God Yahweh. And according to Ken Wilbur, the editor of Quantum Questions, the mystical writings of the world great physicists, their conclusion was that the realms of modern or classical physics and the mysticism have little more or nothing in common. Quantum mechanics and thermodynamics are not here, are not there to prove the mystical worldview. And all attempts in part of modern thinkers to prove mysticism with new physics can be detrimental to the genuine mysticism. Marx Planck, a father of quantum uh, physics, was one view, uh, was one of the view that science and religion deal with two different dimensions of existence, and that between them can be neither conflict nor accord. Albert Einstein was annoyed by this new brand of metaphysics and bluntly stated that, as I quote, the present fashion of applying the axioms of physical science to human life is not only entirely a mistake, but also has something reprehensible in it, end quote. Sir Arthur Eddington, who led the famous expedition that photographed the solar eclipse, which established Einstein's relativity theory on solid ground, stated clearly, as I quote, I repudiate the idea of proving the distinctive beliefs of religion either from the data of physical science or by the methods of physical science, end quote. Sir James Jeans, a mathematician, physicist, and astronomer who was one of the most popular and prominent philosophers of science in the first part of our century, condemned that the claims of science support for transcendental events. A scientist, he finds the, quote, alleged proofs totally unconvincing, end quote, as a human being, he finds the most ridiculous as well. The irony of all this, in fact, that many of these giants in modern physics wrote texts that denote an orientation towards metaphysics, mysticism, and the search for an ultimate reality. They have come to realize that in searching for fundamentals of nature at a subatomic level, they were placed face to face with a world of forces they can represent only by mathematical symbols. Thus, modern physics is nothing but a shadow world of symbols. Modern physics, modern physicists, were compelled to look beyond the shadows or the shadowy world of ordinary reality. But what can they reach or see or palpate? Nothing. Whence came to the notion of quantum fluctuation, the most paradoxical concept of modern physics. 
It stipulates that the whole universe, the whole space time, came into existence out of nothingness. What is beyond that nothingness? Probably an ultimate reality that can be reached only through metaphysical or mystical means. Albert Einstein, in India's and opinions, came to the conclusion that common to all men is a, quote, stage of religious experience, end quote, that he called a cosmic religious feeling. Cosmic religious feeling is born of the contemplation of this of the quote, the sublimity and marvelous order which revealed themselves in both nature and the world of thought, end quote. It is akin to that feeling of awe one experiences on meditating on the conjunct intricacy and complexity underlying every aspect, structure, and form in nature or cosmos. Personally, as a physician who deals every day with the wonders of biology and health and disease and the intricacies of physiology cogently developed, I am overwhelmed by that cosmic feeling as it, be, as it brings me down on my knee in adoration before a creator who has revealed himself as an imminent existence. Einstein himself reached the confines of mysticism when he wanted to experience the universe as a single significant whole. Warner Heisenberg, in his illumination about the ultimate reality beyond the shadow reality of science, asked himself this following question. Was it utterly absurd to seek behind the ordering structures of this world a consciousness whose intentions were these very structures? End quote. He also says that the search for the one or the ultimate source of all understanding has doubtless played a similar role in the origin of both religion and science. End quote. Erwin Schwartinger, uh, um, excuse me, Erwin Schwartinger, probably more diligently than others, also seeking the one he recognized that the following science is reticent to when it when it is a question of the great unity the one of paramedes uh, the one we all of which we of which all somehow form a part to which we belong the most popular name for it is god spelled with a capital g in quote schrodinger's thoughts were more in tune with the doctrines of the Upanishads. He favored the mystical teachings of the identity of all which each other and the supreme mind. He adopted the equation of Ant-Man equals Brahman. And that's, um, excuse me, Atman equals Brahman. The personal uh, self equals the omnipresent, the all comprehending eternal self as the quintessence of deepest insight into the happenings of the world. This awareness has been the prerogative of the mystics of all cultures and can be described as a unique experience condensed in the phrase, I have become God. Schrodinger realized also that the experience cannot be obtained from the outside or simply given as a nominal acknowledgement. It must be approached from the inside by a direct involvement as, as we will see later in the African-Haitian experience of adequism or possession. In, that Vedic, in, in the Vedic Vedantic vision, the mystic becomes a part of the peace of an eternal infinite being an aspect or a modification, as in a pantheism. In that state, an individual becomes all in all. In the French Louis D. Uh, D. Brogel, a recipient of the 1929 Nobel Prize in Physics, in his book Physics and Microphysics, he testified that uh, of that search for ultimate reality as pure science intrinsically purposes the search for this hidden order as the ultimate realities. Sir James Jean, in his work, The Mysterious Universe, also testified that the metaphysical appeal and endeavor, as he stated, many would hold that from the broad philosophical standpoint, the outstanding achievement of 20th century physics is not the theory of relativity with its welding together of space-time or the theory of quanta with its present apparent negation of laws of causation or the dissection of the atom with its resultant discovery that things are not what they seem. It is the general recognition that we are not yet in contact with ultimate reality. End quote. Wolfgang Pauli, um, Wolfgang Pauli, 1945, 
Nobel Prize winner in physics, discovered the famous exclusion principle and the proponent of the existence of a neutrino to of of neutrino two decades before it was discovered and insisted that rationality be supplemented with the mystical. Sir Arthur Eddington, knighted in 1930, was one of the physicists who recognized the limitation of the physical science and who equated the reality behind the shadows of consciousness itself, who sponsored the search of ultimate reality through mysticism. Although he repudiated the idea of proving the distinctive beliefs of religion by the methods of physical science, he nevertheless had limited himself to showing us certain difficulties and reconciling them as in religion and free will with physics that have been removed. And he cautiously acknowledges that the following, the recent changes of scientific thought remove some of the obstacles of a reconciliation of religion with science, but this must be carefully distinguished from any proposal to base religion on scientific theory. For my part, I am wholly opposed to any such attempt." End quote. In spite of the disclaimer, Eddington could not help but recognize that the new physics gives strong grounds for an idealistic philosophy, which I suggest is hospitable towards spiritual religion. Those strong grounds will be taken up by later scientists in metaphysics to produce works such as the Tao of Physics, the Dancing with, with We Lu Masters. However, we see later that E.D. Eddington was right in the sponsoring caution of the process of recognition because of the association of new physics with religion. A new concept of spirituality must be conceived to avoid disastrous confusion between the two realms. From the preceding overview of opinions, we could see that the new physics had incited a search for the ultimate existence where it is revealed where it revealed the new physicists, the intangible world beyond the particles, electrons, quarks, neutrons, axions, and weakly intricating massive particles. Facing forces, energies, and fields, physics, physicists are curious to find out the source of these force fields. On remembering the sayings of the mystics, the physicists saw in their me meditation or trance a means to cross the ambiguity barrier. New Ages who believe modern physics offer positive support for a religious worldview are walking those steps. The paradoxes are principles of quantum physics show parallels or analogies with the spiritual world that are not trivial. Quantum physics does not offer a direct proof of a spiritual world, but indirectly it pushes the individual into the search for the ultimate that so far belongs to the realm of mysticism. Until now, the principles of duality, ubiquity, complementary or correspondence, correspondent state or superstition state, non-local hidden variables, bi-directional aerial of time, parallel universes, and the influence of subjectivity on the objectivity of nature have been tenets in the realm of religion. Now, modern science is revealing to us that they also do exist in the physical world as well. This can be detrimental to religion if faith is centered uniquely on these principles or beliefs. By the same token, in establishing the parallels and analogies we discover that the characteristics up till now attributed to the spiritual world are in fact properties of the physical, invisible dimensions of space-time. This will force us to reconsider the true characteristics of the divine dimension, which is an X dimension made aware to us only through revelation. No physicist can meet God in a bubble chamber like Moses in the burning bush or Mount Sinai. In that sense, modern physics in as and any other physics that will come in the future will not be in position to dismantle the foundations of true mysticism. The divine is off limits to experimental science because God is not of the nature of space time. God's dimension is eternity, a dimension that has no beginning, no end and no change. God is the ultimate transcendence, the imminent existence, Yahweh, the I am who I am. All existence comes from him. Everything in space time or the universe. Thus God's, thus God's name is existence, being, or to be, or to exist. However, that primordial existence has no beginning and no end. It is the opposite of space-time or the universe that has beginning and will have an end. Thus, quantum physics cannot experience God because God is outside the empirical domain of science. Everything included in the great chain of being in the cosmos from matter, life, mind, soul, and spirit belong to space-time and thus are amenable to the scrutiny of modern physics. 
Thus, the one of uh, per Parmenides or Spinoza's pantheism and the universal soul of or Brahman are varying expressions of the same universe or space time. In this context, quantum mechanics have the jurisdiction over them because it works in all possible experimental situations. The state of affairs that will force us to redefine our concept of spirituality by acknowledging the physical or space-time nature of so many so-called spirit manifestations. The oneness with the universal soul reveals itself to be oneness with space-time. The physical cosmos with all its avatars and manifestations, by the same token, matter is no longer seen as the vile, inferior manifestation of existence, the non-conscious element of the universe, but as an entity that is intrinsically, essentially psychic or spiritual, sharing that same pan-psychic feel with all higher beings in the evolutionary ladder of space-time. Furthermore, the terms shadow matter, dark matter, and invisible matter convey a new concept or a variant of matter not made of atoms and molecules, but rather a phys physicality comparable to that of light in its particular form of photon in the wave of function of pure energy. Thus, shadow matter known as axion and WIMP is, excuse me, WIMP all caps, W-I-M-P, is physicality, a force field that can manifest itself as particle or wave. In this, in this, it is immaterial in essence while being physical like all energy fields. This seems to be detrimental to religion or true mysticism, something feared by the founders of quantum physics, by some religious thinkers and other intellectuals. In this new perspective, spirituality is no longer something out of this world, but essentially imminent to the cosmos, to the physical world of force fields, energies, particles, atoms, and man. The quantum fluctuation that began the whole creation in the evolutive process is, is essentially spiritual. The psychic or psych psychionic property is imminent in the cosmos or universe. The universal soul is the psychic manifestation of the unbroken wholeness of space-time. Knowing that space-time is finite by nature, having a beginning and destined to have an end, we must look elsewhere in the search of ultimate reality. In fact, the experience of Eastern seers and that of Haitian African initiates or Vodusi is nothing but an illumination about the hidden dimensions of our ordinary cosmos and also that we can be ambiguous and universal in our unity with the cosmic whole. Visible and invisible being and non-being like a uh, phenomenon diagram a graphic showing the incessant transformation of matter into energy and vice versa. The parallelism between quantum physics and religion can be uh, detrimental when applied to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, but it is not detrimental when applied to Eastern religions and African Haitian metaphysics or religion, uh, metaphysics or religion, because unity with the universal soul or cosmos remains fundamental in those latter faiths. Just to put a pause there, if we pay attention to what is being investigated or unpacked here, he's literally saying that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam do not offer the gateways to quote unquote heaven. If we're just breaking it down very simply, he's being very clear in saying that these big three religions, they provide no gateway outside of space time. They are merely reflecting upon space time and how to make your humanity better. So when people talk about they've been in contact with God and they're Christian or they've been in contact with some, with essentially the other side, what is being espoused here is that they are simply having phantom experiences of still this reality that they're in and they have not contacted the other side at all. Continuing on, the two souls of man described in Haitian, African Haitian ontology belong to the physical world and are subject to entropy which is change, degradation, and evolution. Quantum physics is applicable to them as it works on all exp possible experimental situations in the cosmos and in parallel universes. These souls are part of a reality of which the new physics, quantum physics, relativity, their, uh, relativity, thermodynamics, chaos theory, and study make mathematical abstractions.
The shadow matter discovered in this century seems to correspond with the properties of the body double or samindo, described in the composition of man by the African Haitian world vision. The psychic function of our organism is nothing but an information processing network that encompasses our nervous system and doubles as souls. To the damage that can result from the parallelism with the Judeo-Christian and Islamic vision of God or the spirit of God is in the reduction of a God's own dimension to the dimension of space-time. When in fact, by revelation, the realm of God is the ultimate otherness, the otherness that is that has no beginning and or change. This this is eternity. Thus, modern science cannot know it by empirical means, by using laboratory methods or mathematical abstractions. To do so would be a bound that to reductionism, that some intellectuals cannot accept. However, we cannot reject the reductionistic approach when we are dealing with the entities manifestations that are intrinsically of the nature of space-time or the universal soul. Thus, we are facing two types of mysticism, one that is related to the communion with the unbroken wholeness of the universal self, and one that is related to Yahweh's dimension of ultimate otherness. The otherness dimension, the otherness mysticism cannot be damaged by the parallelism or analogies because there is no common situation. However, there can be association, communication through faith and a trance state as they create conditions that allow communication with the otherness by opening up the dimension and allows contact with the otherness. However, the dimension or wave function should not be confused with the otherness itself. The panpsychism of the universal self can be established instantaneous contact or intention with Yahweh dimension, but it is not the Yahweh, um, but it is not of the Yahweh nature. An evolution or transformation from one realm to another can be allowed only through a new birth. Being born of the spirit is a key to the problem. In the African Haitian vision, this would be equivalent to the acquisition of a new soul, probably like a do dojo like soul to use their own terminology, but a dodo of the eternal dimension. The shadow matter component of nature, along with our internal internal processing system, constitute the physiological and spiritual aspect of man. Being the nature physical, it is amenable to quantum physics and exploration. The new physics reveals to us new vistas, parallel universes, and, and, and their wonders. These fantastic aspects of singularities resemble certain characteristics of the Yahweh dimension, but are not the nature of Yahweh. They are perishable and subject to vanity or entropy. It is in that perspective that the Apostle Paul in the letter to Romans revealed that the whole cosmos, the universal soul, is awaiting its redemption or translation from time to eternity. This can be done only uh, excuse me time to eternity as noted in romans chapter 8 verses 19 through 23 this can only be done by fiat an act of yahweh himself something similar to the quantum fluctuation and aestheticism and transcendental meditation cannot do it because all liberation or nirvana can lead us to a higher state of being and consciousness in our space time or universe we can escape space time only by fiat and this is not of our making we are stuck to that universe, no matter how lofty or ecstatic a station in existence can be. Going on. In contemplating the evolution of African Haitian religion, our vantage point is the theory of eminence as, ex uh, explit as explicited by my poem, Lehem's Conglomerates. And it implies that the light of the new metaphysics derived from quantum physics, relativity, and chaos theory, that Yahweh or God, the ultimate existence and existence of existence, can be seen as the great attractor that creates the finality of evolution. The great attractor establishes the trajectory of evolution from alpha to omega, beginning to end, as the retriever of every occurrence in the evolutionary chain. This seems to parallel the thoughts of the esoterics who see God as as spear and the creatures of evolutine as re spears. The image of strange attractor by analogy illustrates the great feat of creation by when a fiat or quantum fluctuation Yahweh called from his existence the primeval energy or master force scattered, uh, scattered 
to form the universe. To state that initial cosmos soon changes the cos the into the chaos uh, of various forces, of high energy fields, and the equivalents leading to to matter. The power of gravity in becoming finite produced a big bang, another chaotic dissipative system capable of evolution or self organization. However, the cascade of complexities born out of that explosion seem to follow a finality which its trajectory aspiring the return to the source of existence. In the following chapters, this return will be explored. And that has concluded our introduction to the Vodou Gnostic Universe by Reginald Crosley. And so this is volume one of our reading. And we will continue on into subsequent chapters going forward. This is Pharaoh Brown for We Meditate. Live well, family.